Hi, I'm Linda from Little Farmhouse Flowers in Jay, New York. We are growing specialty cut flowers on about two and a half acres in the Adirondack Park in northern New York. I think that my interest and love for growing flowers and working with flowers um, came from, um, at the beginning, probably my parents and my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother loved flowers and I can remember um, always being around them at her place. Um, my parents um, also were gardeners. My mom uh, kept a garden, um, but they were also really creative people. Uh, my mom is a retired physician and she was a surgeon um, for part of her work. and. You know, that's very creative, but outside of uh, what she was doing in the operating room, um, she was also a musician. She played the violin, um, and she loves to draw and paint, and she loves photography. Uh, and my father was a geologist and also um, a tinkerer. He loved to build things, mostly sculptural. And uh, for business, he was running a geothermal heating and cooling business in the 80s and 90s um, when that wasn't really a popular thing to do. People weren't very interested in sustainability and the construction of their homes and so we watched him you know, struggle to, to grow this thing that was um, really focused on saving energy and uh, making good choices uh, for homes and um, watching you know, the blueprints come through and seeing him interact with architectural plans and um, developing systems and building all of these interesting things. And it was great to be a child in his shop and to see him working with all these different tools and um, to be kind of uh, included in, in his adventures that way. And they both um, exposed my sister and I to the natural world whenever they could. Um, we took a family car trip across the country and visited all the different national parks along the way, or um, we would go for a birthday um, to see, you know, mammoth caves and to do some spelunking and, you know, check out all these natural wonders. So I think kind of inherent in our, in our family was this, this desire to, um, observe and enjoy and be in the natural environment. And I think that definitely put me at ease and makes me comfortable, um, outside and in the gardens. My parents also always provided opportunities for me to be making art. And I think, you know, I especially heard from my mother multiple occasions that she felt like she was working hard in her life. Oh my gosh. In order to provide opportunities so that her kids could make, so that they could be creators. So I've always loved art. You know, they made sure that I had opportunities to take art lessons, to visit um, museums in our city, and um, art's always played a really important role in my life. And eventually, um, after college, after you know studying some art there, I became an art teacher to high school students, and I was teaching all different kinds of art, ceramics, uh, digital art, studio art, with you know painting and drawing, kind of traditional media, um, and also doing some some digital work, digital art, graphic design, photography. Um, I really just loved the cr creative experience. I love to see what can be made, and I took um, a great deal of uh, pride and joy in helping my students with original idea generation. I think you know, that figuring out how to be original as an artist is a really intimidating thing for some folks. And um, so I worked to create those um, moments when we could really spark this, this excitement and, and interest. My teaching schedule provided for these long uh, spans of summer vacation time when I had opportunities to grow things. And for me as a visual arts person, I think I tended right um, into flowers and I thought that, that, that they were really interesting. Initially, my, my flower growing experience started with just a few packets of seeds and that's an experience that I think a lot of people can relate to. And the, the wonder that came from those packets was so invigorating. Um, it just, it showed me the possibility, I think, um, from growing things from seed, especially. So, you know, my sister, she sent me a couple packets of zinnias and I bought a couple packets of uh, poppy seeds and that's where it began. My daughter and I planted those and 
that's uh, everything just started to snowball from there, I think. Um, then I really started to dive into researching seeds and um, figuring out all the different kinds of things that I wanted to grow. And that's a journey that I think continues every year. I love to find new things to grow. I love to find new purposes for things that, you know, maybe aren't used in floral design already and, and pull those into the garden as well. Um, so that's really fun to think about um, every season as a new adventure. During one school year, I started to just really get into um, thinking about the possibilities of having a flower farm. I think I was inspired by a lot of the different people who are or have been growing for a long time um, in this um, small cut flower farming industry. Um, and I was, you know, thinking about all these different um, plans, but not really having a place to grow my farm. Um, I actually started all of the seedlings uh, before we had land, before we had a place to put them, because I was so determined to make it happen. Um, so I, it was around the winter time, January, that I decided to leave my teaching job. I gave notice there. And then, you know, we had a, a couple of months, a few months, really, to find a farm and to find a way to, to break ground because I really wanted to um, make a clean transition from one career to the next. And I had the seedlings and they needed to grow and bloom somewhere. So um, I started looking for land and uh, I wanted that sweet spot to be a little bit warmer than where we were, we were working and living in Lake Placid. It's a pretty cold zone up there, two, two three uh, growing zone. Uh, so we looked um, down in this valley, um, the Osable River Valley, where we are now. Um, and we started to find places for sale that either had really great farm infrastructure, barns and fields and everything kind of ready to go from a farming standpoint, but not a comfortable space for our family to move into immediately. Um, or the property might have a very comfortable home and zero uh, farm infrastructure. We went with the latter choice um, because I wanted my family to be comfortable as I was um, uprooting them and moving them from town and starting a new career and, you know, adding a commute to their daily <laughs> daily life. Um, so when we came here, we had uh, a home, but a lot of sod, uh, a really big yard, basically. It's about two and a half acres um, of grass and weedy meadow um, that has um, been turning, is turning into the flower farm that I'd love it to be. That year, I started all of my seeds in the school's greenhouse. Um, they're really generous in allowing me to use a space, um, not really knowing where it was headed or what I was doing with it. But So that's where I was spending a tremendous amount of time, after work, before work, during my lunch break, going to, to attend to the seedlings and bringing them along, and eventually, uh, we would load them all up and move them down here to our new home and um, tuck them inside in the front hall <laughs> when it was, uh, the weather was unfavorable. Um, and then a local goat's uh, milk dairy farm uh, sent their machinist, their tractor machinist, um, three miles up the road to uh, do our first plow. So they plowed the sod under for me and helped me get started. And I had a big pile of compost delivered and I shoveled it um, wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow um, to make my first rose and it was exhausting. <laughs> and I'm not sure that I could do it again, but that's what I did. It can be done very manually. And that's how I got those first seedlings into the ground. Uh, we, we closed on our house here May 1st. And then I think I had everything planted by mid-June uh, for the season. During the first season, I signed up for a farmer's market ahead of time. Again, this all seems very bold. Um, looking back, I, I hadn't been a flower farmer before, but I signed up for the farmer's market. I got my spot. I was determined to do it. Um, and I started uh, to sell my flowers there. And initially, in the very first few markets, um, I relied kind of heavily on my friends in the community to help me get started. Um, one of my friends in Lake Placid um, had a huge meadow of lupin, and she let me come there and pick from it in order to um, have something to take to market. Those very first ones where I didn't have flowers blooming yet, but it didn't take long for the annuals to come in. 
um, and to, to really start to build a name for my business and, and get things going at that um, first farmer's market. I was uh, pretty fortunate to be creating a little bit of a niche at the farmer's markets. Um, there's one that we worked at, um, that I worked at in uh, Keene Valley, a, quite a large farmer's market, and, and another one in Lake Placid. Um, and people were excited to have flowers at them. They'd seen veggie farms, they'd had vegetable CSAs, um, but they hadn't really had um, a consistent flower farmer showing up to those markets. Um, so that was really wonderful. We've transitioned now to offering subscription memberships for flowers um, that are available here for pickup or for delivery to some local towns. Uh, and I've really enjoyed that. And it's um, been a bit of a relief to um, know that those flowers are sold ahead of time. And also to not have to worry about the weather at a farmer's market. You know, if, if the weather was bad and fewer customers came, I might have some lost product lost perishable product. Um, so we do those, uh, those membership subscriptions now, and uh, that's been really wonderful. I think some of my biggest fears around leaving my previous career were, um, you know, just the unknown. I was in a field that I felt so comfortable in, that I'd um, earned a, a very comfortable living at, there were doubters in my peer group, for sure, <laughs> and amongst other people that um, that I encountered in that industry, they you know would kind of look at me and say, "What? You're gonna you're gonna leave this? You're gonna leave an, an administrative role to go and start a flower farm?" Um, and I knew in my mind how big this flower farm could be in terms of supporting me and, and my family, um, but that was a little bit hard to hear those voices of doubt, and of course they. They always kind of put some doubt in your own in your mind too when other people say things like that. But um, so there's that. You know, there was a little bit of worry about um, financial uh, or financial situation because I was going to be again leaving something that was very comfortable and trying to um, make something that is um, not only sustainable in an environmental sense but sustainable in a financial sense so that um, this could support me and, and help our family too. Our farm is about two and a half acres um, and most of it is in cultivation or um, planned to enter into the flower farming process. You know, even some of the areas that um, don't seem exciting for traditional ar uh, agriculture, you know, they might be swampy or, you know, not ideal. Um, we're thinking about how we can grow things there naturally um, that are useful to us, but also, you know, that um, work with the situation, the natural situation, and rather than trying to change the landscape or, or make it, you know, what might be ideal, um, we kind of look to the natural species growing around here and um, plant similar um, varieties um, that can thrive and that are also, you know, can be really profitable for the business. We have a pretty short growing season. Our last frost date can be around June 1st and our first frost can be around September 1st. Um, so those dates are kind of, you know, very sticky in my mind in terms of planning for our season. Um, we do use um, a lot of different things for season extension. Our zone in terms of uh, cold temperatures and, and warm temperatures is about three, four here. Um, maybe leaning more toward 4A, 4B, uh, hopefully. And we serve a lot of clients um, in Lake Placid, which is about half an hour away, and, and their growing zone is a little colder there. Um, but that's why we decided to locate the farm down here um, in this little river valley, in the Osable River Valley. For season extension, we are generally um, moving or building different kinds of tunnels to protect our crops. Um, initially, I was only using low tunnels, you know, about four feet tall, um, that just covered one bed at a time. And those tunnels were incredibly useful to help me get annuals started early in the spring, protect them from frosts and heavy rains and wind. Um, and then I would take down the tunnels mid-season and I would put them up again over my perennial beds to protect those perennials um, from our harsh winters. Um, now that I've been here for a while and I understand what grows well as a perennial and doesn't um, die back in the wintertime, 
um, I can use that same kind of mentality to to protect some per perennials, um, and you know I let others go now to to the snow and everything. Um, we get quite a lot of snow and ice in the winter time. Um, sometimes two feet of snow, heavy wet snow um, at a time. Um, it's kind of you know a greenhouse owner's nightmare <laughs> in some respects, but. Um, the tunnels that we're purchasing now from Farmer's Friend have a gothic profile and the snow sheds off them beautifully. So that's been really uh, a huge relief not to have to worry about those, you know, overnight um, or, you know, if we want to go away for a short period of time in the winter, it's a nice time to relax if you're a farmer, <laughs> flower farmer. Um, I don't have to worry about the snow building up on those tunnels anymore. And we use those tunnels to do all sorts of different things. Uh, we um, overwinter some things in them. If the ground freezes before we can plant them in the field, we start crops early in them. We um, are able to harvest flowers later into the season because of the frost protection from the tunnels. And um, we also will even have used them as pro propagation houses, even though they're unheated, um, by building a series of smaller tunnels inside them and just heating those smaller tunnels. Um, you know, we're kind of limiting the space that we have to heat and the energy, and that's how I've been able to get a whole lot of seedlings started without actually having a large heated greenhouse space. I work here mostly um, by myself this season um, with the help of my family. My husband plays an incredible supportive role in entertaining or taking care of our children and helping with meal uh, preparation, cleaning, laundry, all these things. and. You know, when you talk to him, he'll tell you that he's working hard to make sure that I have as much time to farm as possible, which is a real blessing. Um, and my kids love uh, to help on the farm with harvesting. They get really excited about um, anything having to do with packaging, <laughs> label making, things like that. Um, and sometimes uh, during a busy season or when we have a lot of wedding work, um, I will have a couple of other people here on the farm helping me. Um, and definitely, you know, for some of the big events, we also pull in uh, freelance floral um, designers to help um, because everything has, has to happen so quickly. It's, it's not possible to, to make all of these centerpieces, all of these arrangements in a short amount of time on my own. Um, so we have a great um, little network of uh, designers that, that step in and help us once in a while. Now that I'm working from home, um, I'm much more present in some ways in my family's life. You know, they know that they can find me somewhere outside, um, you know, right outside the door, which is wonderful. It is, you know, a tremendous amount of hard work and long hours, especially during the season. Um, but in the winter time, when things are a little bit slower for me and busier for my husband, I'm more present in in my children's lives. Then um, we do have so much shared joy over the things that are growing and the things that we're harvesting here on the farm. And I see that um, in my kids. I see that in their wonder when they're um, chasing frogs and grasshoppers and um, really being outside so much more than in our life before farming. I think that there's a, a gift to them that we are giving them by having this life outdoors. And um, this is our way of instilling in them the same values and, and interest in nature that I receive from, from my family, I think. Each of our two children, they really uh, enjoy different aspects of farming. Uh, for my son, uh, harvesting things like ornamental pumpkins that are, they, they seem more tangible, I think, to him. That's, that's his thing. He loves to be the pumpkin guy, and he's um, really excited about uh, getting together with me and about our time um, collecting pumpkins and counting them and sorting them and um, I don't know his his face lights up when when we're pumpkin hunting and the pumpkin patch uh, and my daughter you know she is just so helpful she just wants to lend a hand especially when she sees that things are getting busy um, you know she'll just say how can I help mom how can I help and and I'm I'm really blessed to have them here and to have them involved in my business and to, I think, to, to let them see, you know, this whole process. You know, they've really grown up with me um, figuring this out and starting a business and, 
and growing it into something that you know we're all really proud of and um, that's exciting. We grow a wide variety of flowers and greens here on the farm. Um, one of the things that's most interesting to me is to kind of um, figure out which things are going to be happiest growing here and kind of lean more into those varieties, but um, a whole bunch of different things. Um, sunflowers, dahlias, um, those are really exciting right now. Lilies, uh, tulips are an important crop for us, um, and a whole host of different kinds of perennials that are really happy here. Peonies, lupin, um, globe thistle, sea holly. Um, I'm kind of looking out the studio window here at <laughs> the different things, um, different kinds of rudbeckia. Um, and we have some specialty items that we are growing undercover, um, like garden roses and um, heirloom chrysanthemums, um, things like that. Living and farming here creates an incredible um, challenge sometimes. The, uh, the weather can be brutal. Um, the short season can be really challenging. I think it's important to me to find ways to make this business work year round. And that's something that's, that's important. It's, um, it might mean drying flowers so that we can provide different kinds of products in the fall, like wreaths or dried floral bouquets, um, transitioning into holiday work um, with evergreens and wreaths and garlands, things like that. Um, and then also figuring out really the art and science behind uh, forcing bulbs. Um, so for me, those are mostly uh, tulips and lilies. Uh, tulips are a really um, interesting crop. Uh, we have tulips blooming from the end of December all the way through June um, in a variety of successions. And um, that's a, a really exciting um, journey, um, figuring out how to how to encourage them to bloom over such a long period of time. The winters can be pretty bleak here in the northern Adirondacks. Um, lots of snow, lots of gray days, hardly any color. So being able to bring tulips um, to customers in January and February and do it sustainably and responsibly is really um, wonderful. Our flowers find their way into customers' hands a few different ways. Um, a local independent grocery store uh, sells them uh, weekly, so we have a weekly delivery there, a whole bunch of bouquets, and that's wonderful. Uh, we sell them through a subscription membership in six-week seg segments of weekly flower arrangements or bouquets uh, for pickup here at the farm or for delivery to the local towns. Um, we have experimented with some shipping um, earlier in the season to help move some of our uh, hardy spring uh, flowers, ranunculus and anemones and tulips. Um, and then we also do a lot of wedding work. Um, this area is so full of natural beauty, it kind of lends itself to destination wedding events. And there's a big market for that kind of work, um, design work. Um, all in all the towns around us, surrounding us. So um, primarily our income from the flower farm is also coming through a design stream. So the, we're growing the flowers as farmers and we're working with them also as florists. Um, and a big portion of my work year round, um, but especially in the winter, is working to earn those wedding jobs, to write proposals, um, and to create plans for our clients that will um, share with them the possibilities of local flowers. Um, we are living in a Pinterest world and oftentimes people will come to us with a, a preconceived understanding of what wedding flowers are or, or what they can be. And it's really um, interesting to show them what's possible here. Um, you know, some, some folks are a little bit concerned, you know, I know you're growing the Adirondacks, they might say it it's, seems uh, challenging or I don't know what you might have, um, but the truth is we have a great deal available um, almost year round here in terms of flowers. Um, so yeah, so, so sharing that message and, and getting the word out that local flowers even here are possible and beautiful. Um, is, is a big part of my work. 
sometimes in the winter it can be difficult to communicate to a client what their summer wedding flowers are going to look like. So I put together an extensive um, proposal document that has lots of images of the flowers that I'm going to be growing for them. This is often a, a curated process of planning flower beds and selecting varieties specifically for events that will be happening in the future, months and sometimes even a year or two out. Um, so lots of pictures. And I also do some illustration and, and my background in the arts um, comes into play in my business in that way too. Um, because I can't provide a floral mock-up or an, a sample of how an arrangement um, would look as a selling point. You know, this is something a conventional florist might do any time of year, um, buy in flowers from somewhere in the world where they're in bloom, create a sample um, to photograph or to show to a client. It's just not possible when I am committed to only using local flowers. Um, so I'll actually do some illustration. I'll do some drawing for them. Um, and right now I'm doing most of that digitally, which makes things a little bit easier and faster. But um, when I started, it was all um, pen and paper and, and watercolor. And um, I love that I'm also creating this very personalized process for them. Um, you know, this is, this is a piece of my, my heart and mind goes into each of these documents. Um, and I think, you know, I see um, from the customer's perspective, my investment in um, their journey of planning this event um, is very real. In terms of farming, some of the biggest challenges I think um, are similar for farmers anywhere. There, there's pest pressure, there's weed pressure. Um, the bugs and the weeds might be different depending on where you're growing in the country, but those are kind of common challenges and as well as climate challenges. Um, cold and frost are, are really tough here. Um, in terms of, you know, running a small business or, or getting into the wedding industry, you know, that's challenging too. It's hard to sell um, work if you don't have a body of work to show. Um, so it was, you know, really important initially for me to to invest in my own education, to take some design workshops, to get some good photography of my work so that I could show samples. And I just started showing those samples at the very first farmer's markets that we did. I also brought a, a binder, a small you know, paper portfolio with pictures of arrangements that I'd made. Um, and some of our very first uh, wedding jobs came from just being able to show that. So um, the value of, you know, good photography of, of capturing and documenting your work is uh, very important to the design world here. Operating a small farm and a floral design business um, together at the same time as a, sometimes a one woman show is very challenging. So I'm, I'm often thinking about how I can be more efficient um, that's kind of a, a stream that's always running through my mind. Like, how can I do this easier, more efficiently, faster, um, better, basically? Um, so there are some things that we do here that help out a lot with that. And sometimes it's a very simple tool. Um, I use the bulb crates that our tulips come in for growing lots of plants. Um, that makes the whole plant or plants portable, I can just lift them up and I can move them into shelter or into a tunnel if they were growing outside or vice versa. Um, I can move them you know, into our cellar and under grow lights if I need to you know, bring them inside. Recently, I've transitioned from using a propane torch to burn holes in our reusable landscape fabric, that's our weed barrier, um, to using this electric tool, um, which uh, is a calf dehorner. Um, but it, uh, it heats up and it's the perfect um, circumference hole to, to melt holes through the landscape fabric very quickly and cleanly. So there's no over melting, the holes don't get too large. Um, we also don't have to go out and buy propane um, all the time. It's a really um, useful um, tool that's, you know, we're using it in a way that's not intended, but it's helpful to us. Um, I'm thinking also about how we design spaces and how um, everything 
um, in my studio can be used in different ways. The, how to make it transition in the summertime from a design space to a um, cold storage space where we can root the tulip bulbs and they can get established before we pull them into a growing uh, space. How we can transition from the shelves holding vessels for weddings to hanging grow lights for starting the seedlings. All of these different um, ways to make use of, of what we have and do it efficiently um, help things run smoothly here. This season we invested in a pyro weeder from Farmer's Friend, um, which we think um, is going to substantially help us mitigate the weed pressure on our plants. Uh, we're, we are surrounded um, by two open meadows of naturally occurring weeds and their seeds just blow in constantly. They're, my enemies are constantly, you know, blowing through the fence, over the fence, um, into the gardens. So the weed fabric helps some with that, but there's still so much weed pressure. And with the pyro weeder, um, we can prepare a bed, um, you know, add our compost and our amendments, get everything ready, have it all, you know, nice um, tilled and, and fluffy and um, walk this four foot wide pyro weeder down the bed, you know, um, and burn off all of those weed seeds. So we've used it a few times already and we're really excited to make it a part of our um, our everyday practice in terms of bed prep um, to really, you know, help us be more efficient in the amount of time that we're spending weeding every season. This is like, this is very exciting. The things that make this work really exciting and fulfilling for me are that every day is different. Some days I'm gonna be completely filthy dirty from head to toe, sweaty, been moving compost and transplanting or seeding things. And um, right when I start to get kind of exhausted from that mode, my life will change and I'll be working more on the design side. Or I can kind of take a pause from that and come in and do some photography or work on a wedding proposal. Or, or be polished up and delivering flowers and installing them at a beautiful event um, in town. So it doesn't get boring at all because I have this, um, this wonderful cycle of all these different things that happen. And of course that changes throughout the year, um, but that's what keeps the work um, interesting to me for sure. Outside of farming, spending time with my family is a really important um, aspect of my life. And Fortunately, um, you know, a lot of my children's activities are taking place during the school year when things are a little bit less busy here. Um, my daughter's an avid dancer and my son's creative outlet is through soccer and he is really um, very creative actually um, in that sport too. So during the school year, I'll spend a lot of time taking my daughter to and from her dance lessons, um, spending time with her as she prepares for her performances, going to performances. Um, those are kind of the special uh, mother-daughter moments that we share. Um, wow, my um, husband and my son are, are really working on his interest in soccer um, outside of school. As a person who is interested in the visual arts, this is really my way that I found to be making, um, be designing, and to be earning a living at the same time. Um, this is what works for me. I have an innate need to, to tinker, to create, to build things. Um, I just happen to be growing my own art supplies and creating um, work that is uh, performance art in a way. It's going to, it's never going to be the same each time I create it and it's never going to be the same from one day to the next day as it eventually, you know, trails off and um, shows how perishable it is. But um, this is this is my art form, and um, making is really important um, to me personally. For anyone who's thinking about starting a farm or or becoming a flower farmer, especially, my biggest piece of advice is to just start, just just start, just plant some seeds and get them going and. Um, start nurturing them and start small and start realizing that it is possible to fit this, um, this hobby or what may be a business into your life. And um, at some point, you know, maybe it will, you'll feel it start to take over. You'll just know that um, it needs to, it needs more of your time, more of your attention. Um, and, 
and that's when you'll know that this is what you were supposed to be doing and um, that it might be time to to make a transition in your life but that the biggest the biggest piece of advice is to just get going however small that that is for you or or large but a few packets of seeds that's all it really takes with locally grown flowers um, vegetables local farms we're able to bring products to market that you just can't otherwise get. Um, many of the flowers that we grow here can't be shipped or can't be shipped easily or don't last long if they are sent from far away. Um, so that's a great reason to support local in, you know, to start, you know, these products that you just can't have otherwise. Um, they're so readily available um, with the heart from the hardworking farmers in your area. Um, another reason is that many of these um, small um, farms especially are growing or, or raising livestock in a more sustainable and a more responsible manner. So when I think about the goods that I'd like for my own family to enjoy, to consume, um, I'd like, I like the reassurance that, of knowing that they were um, grown in a safe manner, that they aren't, you know, pumped full of pesticides or um, sprayed with this, that, or the other thing. Um, there's so many important, important reasons. And of course, you know, um, we're thinking about how we are also as, as farmers, um, as people who grow crops, um, contributing to um, our, uh, our local environment here, how we are supporting um, our pollinators and um, creating a, a, a space that is, you know, is green and that is is giving back to nature hopefully as as much as we are uh, benefiting from it not only am i trying to operate a very environmentally friendly a very sustainable farm but i'm also carrying that um, practice over into the design studio into the the florist part of my life and being a sustainable florist or a business owner, you know, there are so many different factors that play into um, really decisions that I'm making. Um, you know, it, it will determine what type of uh, vehicle I buy. If I need to replace my delivery van, I'm going to try to make a, a more sustainable choice in terms of, you know, how we're getting flowers out into the world. Um, it also informs how we design with flowers, how we work with them, the materials that we choose to use or not use. Um, you know, right now we are working without any sort of floral foam, and this is a commitment that we've made for several years now um, because this material, floral foam, um, you know, it, it breaks down into microplastics and it's really horrible for the environment. And we know um, now from specific research that um, those microplastics are ingested by small organisms and they work their way back up through the ecosystem eventually into the food that we eat um, ourselves. So um, I think, you know, sustainably um, designed floral work is really important. Um, it's certainly a cornerstone of what we do here. And it's a part of the education that we provide to the consumer when they come to us as well. You know, most customers are uninformed about um, the things that may be actually going into the flower, their flower designs. Um, you know, at first thought, you know, maybe they're thinking there might be, there could be pesticides on, on flowers. Maybe they won't even be thinking about that, honestly, because it's not something that they're eating or consuming. Um, but they certainly often aren't thinking about um, how uh, floral installations are made. You know, th those are sort of behind the scenes things. And so these commitments that, that we're making um, to um, be more sustainable, to hide water vessels inside our installations instead of using flower foam, those are sort of behind the scenes um, commitments. They're so important, um, but they're not things that people would necessarily see or ask for. And it's part of our job to, to share that information and to put it out there and to help people know um, that the decisions that they make um, in terms of even floral work um, really have an impact um, down the line on our environment too. Last winter, um, I became one of the founding ambassadors for the Sustainable Floristry Network. And this is a group of, um, a small group of florists um, all over the world 
who are committed to working sustainably. Um, we don't use flower foam. We um, are trying to use our own or locally sourced flowers. Um, we're being really thoughtful about all these different decisions. And together, we're all committed to providing education um, and to sharing this message and to helping other uh, florists come on board. So it is grounded in research that our founders um, helped to propel from a university in Australia. And the momentum is just picking up and, and growing. And it's, um, it's really fun to, to see this, this new project come together and to be working with people all over the world who are passionate about making uh, floristry more sustainable, making it healthier and safer for everyone. Mm -hmm.